Welcome back, folks, to WrestleRant, where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network. First of all, I would like to offer a correction from my previous video in the 2001 Royal Rumble review. I said that Maven eliminated The Undertaker in that show, uh, in that Royal Rumble. That was not accurate. I got my Royal Rumbles mixed up. I was in the midst of watching the O2 Rumble when I was reviewing that one, so I was a little confused. And uh, coming off the sickness and whatnot, I got a little confused with those two Rumbles. But nevertheless, though, that was this Royal Rumble where Maven eliminated The Undertaker, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, this is the 2002 Royal Rumble. Kicking off the show was the WWF Tag Team title match with Spike Dudley and Taz teaming up to defend their WWF Tag Team titles against a duo of Bobby Roode, uh, Bubba Ray and uh, Devon Dudley, the Dudley Boys, of course. So a pretty good match for the most part. Only went about five minutes. Uh, the same show that Taz made his debut at two years prior. Of course, not the in the same place that he was two years ago to that massive reaction on the 2000 show. Um, but still, they were a pretty good match for what it was. Spike Dudley facing off against his former two brothers, so to speak. The match itself was decent. It really wasn't anything too special. Um, definitely paled in comparison to the previous two, to the prior two installments of Royal Rumble when it comes to tag team title matches. It was okay. Like I said, it went only about five minutes. But it really wasn't anything too special compared to the Edging Christian versus Dudley Boy match from the 01 installment or the Dudley Boys versus the Hardys match from the 2000 installment. Okay match, a decent way to kick off the show. Tag team titles remain with Spike Dudley and Taz. Up next for the Intercontinental Championship, Edge defending against William Regal. A good build up here. They showed a brief video package kind of recapping their rivalry going into the show with William Regal specializing in his power of the punch with the brass knuckles. And uh, that definitely came into play here, especially with the finish, him knocking out Edge when the referee was down to win the Intercontinental Championship. His first of two Intercontinental titles, the second one would, of course, come in 2008, many years later. But uh, William Regal winning his first major singles championship in WWE, not named the European or uh, Hardcore Championship. So a pretty good matchup here, really enjoyed it. And this was right around the time that Edge was breaking around, was, was breaking from Christian and was kind of breaking on his own as a single star, had already been Intercontinental Champion before, and dropped the title here to William Regal. So a good match, nothing like too memorable, like I said before, but what I did, what, what did stand out to me about this matchup was the fact that it had a good build-up, Edge was being built up as a star on the rise for the most part. I don't ever, I don't think they ever really saw him as anything above a certain level for a long time, because of course it wouldn't be for another four years until he would win his first world champion the world championship in the WWE in the form of the WWE title at New Year's Revolution 2006, which I reviewed here on the channel cheap plug. Make sure to go back and check it out. But uh, he was a very solid mid-card act at this time. was getting a nice rub in his matches with the legendary, not, not more so legendary, but the veteran that was William Regal. So a uh, good match here. Intercontinental Championship changes hands. Up next for the WWF Women's Championship, Tress Stratus defending the gold against Jazz in this match. Also had a special guest referee in Jacqueline. So most of the matchup, which only went about only four minutes, um, not the best women's title match in Royal Rumble history. I thought the stuff with China and Ivory from the year prior told a better story. Of course, that was a shorter matchup, and I already expressed my disappointment with that when I reviewed that show. But, uh, I mean, this was in any, any ordinary matchup. There really wasn't anything about this that kind of stood out as being great. Trish Stratus was already kind of uh, catching her stride as the women's champion as a single star because it was a year prior at Royal Rumble when she was attached at the hip to Kurt Angle and Mr. McMahon, and she was kind of the valet for all these different wrestlers. And this was around the time that she started to break out on her own as a star in the, in the women's division. And uh, most of the matchup had to do with the, you know, the history between Jazz and Jacqueline. Those two having a, a beef with one another. And Jacqueline, in a way, kind of costing Jazz the matchup by not counting the pinfall at a few occasions. Uh, leading to Trish retaining her women's championship. So again, decent matchup. Better than anything we see nowadays with the Divas and the Divas championship. But uh, still, kind of lacked a story as compared to the prior installments of the Royal Rumble. Could have been better than what it was. But what, for what it was, it was decent. It was fine. Trish Stratus walks away with the women's championship still intact. So up, not, up next, we get our first great matchup of the night. Really entertaining stuff, which I really liked. And we have a street fight between Ric Flair and Mr. McMahon. This was around the time that Ric Flair had made his grand return to the WWE for the first time in over a decade. Um, you know, taking control of Monday Night Raw, sharing ownership of the flagship show with Mr. McMahon himself, leading to this street fight at the Royal Rumble. The uh, pre-match video package kind of established that nicely with Ric Flair since... 
Mr. McMahon was signed on as a wrestler on the roster. Ric Flair put himself in a match against Vince McMahon. And I think it was Ric Flair himself. Uh, I don't know if it was Ric Flair. I think it was him in his, in his documentary that I watched a couple of months ago on the WWE Network where he talked about how when he was brought in to do the whole commissioner stuff, when he was sharing Raw with Vince and stuff like that, it really wasn't meant to be anything other than just an angle where he was a non-wrestling personality, but it eventually turned into him becoming a full-time wrestler from that point forward. He had a really good match with Vince on the show, who was a non-wrestler for the most part, had a very entertaining match. I mean, of course, it wasn't a five-star classic or anything, but for two guys, for one guy that had been out of the ring for a while, and one guy that was not a wrestler for the most part at all, Mr. McMahon, they had a really entertaining street fight with uh, Flair's kids at ringside and taking pictures and whatever else. I don't think Charlotte was there. I think it was Megan, I think, was one of his daughter's names. I don't think Charlotte was in attendance. But uh, it was a really entertaining match, though. But getting back to what I was saying before, the whole Ric Flair thing, this was really all where it kind of started. I believe this was his first match back as a, WWE, as a wrestler since signing back with the WWE in 2001. You know, before going on to face The Undertaker at WrestleMania, then a full-on six-year run. Much like with Shawn Michaels in 2002, he thought he was coming back for one match against Triple H. You know, this also same year, 2002, at SummerSlam, he would go on to do the Elimination Chamber, and the rest is history. The guy wrestled for another eight more years before retiring in 2010. Similar story with Ric Flair. From what I believe, I think that's correct. I'm not exactly sure, but... I'm just kind of going off what I heard from Rick himself in his documentary on the WWE Network, if you want to check it out. But uh, really entertaining matchup. Ric Flair wins with the figure four leg lock to pick up the victory. So very grand in-ring return for Ric Flair at the same event where he won the Royal Rumble 10 years prior. So no better place to host his in-ring return than at the Royal Rumble. Up next, for the undisputed WWE Championship, we had Chris Jericho defending against The Rock. And of course, this was one month removed from when Chris Jericho unified the WCW World Heavyweight and the WWE Championships into one to become the first ever undisputed champion in WWE history. And of course, The Rock would invoke his rematch clause on the show to face Chris Jericho. The match itself was really, really good. Jericho and Rock have always had great matches together. The only thing that really bothered me about this, and, you know, kind of going off the entire run of Chris Jericho's Undisputed Champion, I mean, it was a grand accolade, of course, and it got Jericho a major rub, kind of solidified him in a way as a top-tier superstar in WWE. But what was really wrong with it, what was really wrong with it was that the fact that most of his championship defenses, <coughs> and Chris Jericho talked about this himself in his book, I believe, in his, uh, in, in his second book, in that he won most of his matches <coughs> via interference and disqualification and count out and everything else to the point where his championship run was pretty much bogged down by, um, in much like The Miz, how he was booked in 2010, 2011, when he was WWE champion, he was winning most of his matches with cheating and the interference. And I mean, of course, it is in the in a, in a heels book to cheat and stuff to win matches, but not to the point where there was someone interfering every five minutes in every single one of your t title defenses to make that champion look weak. I'm not saying that Jericho was a weak world champion, but it got to the point where it was just ridiculous, and it got to that point in this matchup with interference from Lance Storm and I believe Christian as well, and I think that was before they became the, the Un-Americans. might have been afterwards, but I think it was before though, and they wouldn't form any kind of alliance with Jericho for the most part from what I believe. Um, just some brief run-in for Rock to, you know, get distracted for Jericho to capitalize. Just a lot of interference that really bogged down to the finish of that match. Uh, a solid match on the whole, though. Really enjoyed it. Jericho coming up victorious. Still the undisputed champion. So then we get to the Royal Rumble match itself. And this was the Royal Rumble. Not the whole one Royal Rumble, where I talked about in my last video. Where Maven eliminated The Undertaker. And The Undertaker was a heel at this point in time. And The Undertaker... <coughs> Had a very strong showing in this matchup with the seven eliminations. Was in this match, not for even very long. He was only in it for about seven minutes or so. Um, but still, though, he had a pretty dominant showing while he was in there eliminating seven superstars before being taken out by Maven, the Tough Enough winner, in uh, the Shockers of all Shockers. And it definitely goes down as one of the greatest and biggest, most shocking moments in Royal Rumble history. And like I said in that video, my last video, where it was where I incorrectly said that it was in that Royal Rumble, but Maven didn't really benefit from this spot for the most part. It was really just kind of meant for the shock value. I mean, he was beating the shit out of him after this matchup. Um, Undertaker took him up the crowd, and he took him into the backstage area, and where the fans were up above in the concession stand area. He just beat the living crap out of him, and I don't think Maven got much of a push after this 
at, at all. I mean, he was with the company for another three, four, or five years. Um, never really did anything. I don't know if he won any championship gold when he was in WWE. But, uh, I mean, this was a great way to kick off his career for the most part with a huge Undertaker elimination. But, like I said, he didn't really benefit it from too much because Undertaker beat the crap out of him afterwards and his career really went nowhere. The fact that really no one knows who Maven is. I mean, of course, the long-term fans do. But, I mean, like, casually, he's never brought up. You would never even know if you didn't go back and watch this kind of stuff on the network or you weren't a long-time wrestling fan. You wouldn't even know who the hell Maven was. Um, but still, though, a great shocker. And we had a few other surprises in this Royal Rumble, much like we did in the 2000 and the 2000 installment and 2001 installments as well. The Godfather, who I also said returned in the 2001 Royal Rumble, I was also inaccurate in that too. I was thinking of this one. He was the God. He was the Good Father in the 01 Rumble. The Godfather in this one got a big pop when he came out. Wasn't in there for very long. Was only in there for about two minutes, but uh, <coughs> had a very uh, entertaining showing, nevertheless. Gold Dust actually coming back at number two. Um, I think Goldust and Jericho in 2013 might be the only two superstars to return to the Royal Rumble at the either the one or two numbers. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. But Goldust, they didn't make a big deal about him coming back. And I don't think he had been in the company for a couple years. Maybe since 96 or 97. I can't remember when exactly. But um, they didn't make a huge deal about Goldust being back in the Royal Rumble. But he did last a while, which was good to see. He was in there for about 13 minutes or so. Had a good showing, and I think he would you know, be back with WWE full-time for the remainder of 2002. He had a nice run with Booker T in the tag team division for a while in the latter half of the year. But um, yeah, Goldust had a very good showing here, so I was glad to see him back. We would also get a return for Mr. Perfect, who I thought shockingly returned in the Rumble itself. And uh, the the lack of reaction of the commentators, like Jim Ross said, Oh my God, it's... It's it's Mr. Perfect. Like I thought it was, you know, huge. I thought it was a huge return. But then I would find out after watching this pay per view and reading the Wikipedia page that Mr. Uh, Mr. Perfect was actually announced for the 2002 Royal Rumble a few weeks beforehand. So it was already kind of built up to. But still, though, it was very nice to see him back. He had a great showing here. Um, I think one of the longest reigning superstars in the Rumble. The only person that beat him out, I believe, was Kurt Angle himself. I'm looking at the Wiki page right now. Mr. Perfect had. 15 minutes and 18 seconds, and Kurt Angle had 16 minutes and 9 seconds. Kurt Angle also has an amazing showing here, too. Of course, involved in a feud with Triple H at the time. And, you know, the two would also, of course, collide on the Royal Rumble pay-per-view one year prior for the WWE title. They didn't, of course, mention that on commentary. But, uh, you know, and now colliding in the final two of the Royal Rumble matchup in 2002. So I thought that was pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, going back to Mr. Perfect, he had a really good showing here for a guy that hadn't been with the company for 5, 6, 7, 8 years. I'm at a great showing here. Second longest reigning superstar in the entire Rumble. Made it to the final three, which I was really shocked about. Uh, lasted longer than Stone Cold Steve Austin. I was really shocked about that. But uh, yeah, Steve Austin. Oh, I'm sorry. Those two were not the longest reigning. I'm looking at uh, Mr. Perfect was the fourth longest reigning. Kurt Angle was the third. Longest reigning was actually Steve Austin himself with 26 minutes and 48, 46 seconds. And second longest rating was Triple H to the eventual winner with 23 minutes and 14 seconds. I missed those by accident. But um, yeah, I, I love the final four. We had Steve Austin, Triple H, Kurt Angle, and Mr. Perfect. So a great final four. Big Show didn't last very long. He had a dominant showing while he was in there. But uh, he would eventually get taken out by Kane, so he didn't last very long at all. Kane, I, I, despite a, you know, a, a huge showing the year prior at the Royal Rumble, also did not last very long. Rob Van Dam was over, Booker T was over, but neither of those guys lasted very long either. But uh, yeah, Kurt Angle and Triple H having a nice little exchange to close the matchup. Triple H would emerge victorious, only weeks removed from his grand return at Madison Square Garden on Monday Night Raw. He would go on to WrestleMania to challenge Chris Jericho for the undisputed WWE Championship. So on the whole, I thought this was a pretty good Rumble. Um, I enjoyed the 01 Rumble a little bit more, but I still thought that this was pretty, pretty solid for the most part. Um, the show on the whole, I didn't think it was great. I thought the 2000 and 2001 installments were better. Um, in terms of an undercard, especially the undercard, the Rumble wasn't like significantly worse than the other two, but the undercard definitely was. It wasn't a terrible undercard, but it was just kind of underwhelming for the most part. Tag team title match <coughs> was decent. IC title match, decent. Uh, and, the, and the women's title match was decent too. So those three matches were okay. I enjoyed Regal Edge, but nothing like must-see. Nothing you need to go out of your way to see. And uh, I think it was really all about the Rumble itself and some of the returns that we got in there, and especially the Final Four, which I thought was great. 
as well as Ric Flair versus Mr. McMahon, which was entertaining. You don't need to be like a five-star Matt Technician wrestling fan to enjoy that matchup. It was just kind of brawling for the most part, but it was fun. And then Jericho versus The Rock kind of bothered me a little bit with all the interference, like I mentioned before, but it was still a good match for the most part, so I give this show a mild thumbs up. I didn't think it was a great show, but um, it is worth sitting through because 2 is one of my favorite years, um, especially for the SummerSlam and Survivor Series events, which I've talked about here before on the, on the channel. Um, go back and check them out here on the WrestleRant series. But uh, yeah, I always loved O2. I always loved the Attitude Era, not the Attitude Era, or the Attitude Era too, but if, especially the Ruthless Aggression Era in this time period. Um, with everything that went on from O2 to O5, I just loved it. I don't know, I just love going back and watching pay-per-views from O2 to O5. I thought it was great. And this was one of them. I thought this was a really good rumble. So go back and check it out on the WWE Network in my next WrestleRant video the upcoming this uh, weekend, I believe, this upcoming Saturday, if all goes well. I will be reviewing the 2004 installment of the Royal Rumble before talking about, and you know, in weeks to come, 05, 08, uh, 07, 07, 08, 05, let me, go, let me backtrack here, uh, 04, 05, 07, 08, 09, 2010, and not 09, 2010 and 2011, so I sorry, I'm sorry if that confused you, but uh, still, those are the Royal Rumbles to be reviewed in coming weeks for the remainder of the month of January. So look forward to that. But as always, folks, thanks for watching. Listening always means a lot. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys in my next video.